Dear students, in previous videos, we have seen the various factors that contribute towards large scale circulations in the context of atmosphere as well as also understood the regional factors that result in formation of precipitation. Now, as civil engineers, we would primarily deal with the quantification as well as how to manage the precipitation events. So, for that we have to measure the precipitation first. In this video, we are going to discuss various ways to measure precipitation, identify how many recording stations or gauges that we would need to effectively monitor how much precipitation has fallen in a given area and what are the factors that decide how many, what is the density of such recording stations we require in a given region. So, to record the precipitation, we primarily use two kind of devices. First one are broadly classified as non-recording type and second one are classified as recording gauges. As the name suggests, in non-recording type, we are not automating the process of calculating how much precipitation has happened, but we have to manually go to the site and look for uh, what is the volume of water we have collected in certain containers. And in recording type gauges, we automate the process of measuring the amount of precipitation that has fallen in a given area. So basically, when we talk about non-recording type, the most commonly used non-recording gauge to measure precipitation is Simmons gauge, S-Y-M-O-N-S -S gauge. And in context of recording gauges, we use tipping bucket type or weighing bucket type and natural siphon type. You might have heard of this siphon action in your fluid mechanics class, but we will look into detail that how these gauges work. So we'll start with the Simmons gauge, which is a non-recording type gauge. So what we do here is that we collect the water into a collecting bottle and water is guided into this collecting bottle through the funnel. This is the figure that I have taken from our standard textbook. But if you look it into real life, this is how a Simmons gauge would look like. So it is set up at some clearance above the ground so that minor diversions like crawling animals or uh, debris that is flowing along with wind does not impact the recording in the, our uh, gauge significantly. Also, on top we have a funnel which guides the water into our container and we measure how much height of water we have fallen, uh, we have collected that has fallen in a given piece of land and typically precipitation is often referred in the units of depth and by default it would mean that if 2.54 inches of precipitation has fallen that is that means that we are talking about per unit square of area, either per meter square or per uh, feet square area. And every time this depth is calibrated to be expressed per meter square or in the units of area. And whenever we will account for the precipitation in future, we will only mention 2.5 centimeter or 2.5 inch and you should readily know that we are talking this in the context of per unit area of precipitation that has been fall received in that particular region. Now, the issue with this Simmons gauge is that somebody has to continuously monitor these gauges. They have to go there, physically look into the level of water that we have collected in the collecting bottle. And in India, it is typically done every 24 hours and the standard time recommended by IS 4986 is 8.30 a.m. You know that in India, many of the design practices, they are governed by uh, IS codes or Indian standard codes, which are published by Bureau of Indian Standards and Simmons gauge recommendation regarding its dimensioning, how to position it. They are all discussed in detail in IS 4986. We will not go into detail of the codal provisions here, but in future, if you need to refer or in your workplace, you have to deal with Simmons gauge. This is the code to go. Now, as we mentioned, as we discussed is that if we have a heavy or torrential rainfall and this gauge gets full, it would start overflowing resulting in inaccurate ass assessments or inaccurate measurements of precipitation. So to overcome this difficulty that somebody has to go every time and make the measurements at a fixed time, we are switching to 
recording gauges which automatically keep on recording the data plotting the data and all we do is that access those records either electronically or on a piece of paper and get the idea of amount of precipitation that has fallen so the first of the first of the these kind of devices that we are going to discuss is a tipping bucket gauge so what we do in tipping bu tipping bucket type gauge is that we have two pieces of buckets which are resting about a pivot and there is a funnel that again directs the water into these pivots as soon as the water reaches the level of 0.25 mm of precipitation this bucket would tip downward by virtue of its weight and water will be collected here as soon as it tips here there is a pencil that is set up with this tipping you see that there is a pencil that is setting up here, that is set up here around the pivot and this pencil makes a plot or electronic pen make a plot as this tipping happens where each tipping represents 0.25 mm of precipitation that has been received now such a simple mechanical equipment is automatized and it gives us the measures of precipitation quite precisely and now when this tips here this region 2 come at the center and now water will start falling into that again this will tip here and this will keep on happening until our entire bucket gets full now modern version of versions of tipping bucket type gauges also have a drainage so that once we are receiving a torrential rainfall or storms in a given area and water exceeds certain threshold into our collecting bucket there is a mechanism to automatically empty these collecting buckets the third type of rainfall or precipitation gauge that we commonly use is the weighing weighing bucket gauge what happens here again we have a funnel that directs the precipitation into a big bucket which is set up on a weighing mechanism now as the weight of water into this bucket increases it is attached to a spring spring goes down and this spring in turn is attached to a pen arm and as it goes down we get certain scribbles on this graph paper and it tells us how much precipitation has been uh, received in that area depending upon what is the depression that we receive in the tip of the pen which is which in turn is plotting the results on graph paper if you see that recording mechanisms are all same that we have some way to collect or measure the weight either pre calibrated or using the weighing gauges and in that in turn is coupled with a pen or pen arm that automatically keep on tracing the results on the graph paper finally the most commonly used recording type gauge is natural siphon type as we discussed is that the mechanism is going to be same that we will have an apparatus such that wherever uh, water falls it has some ability to measure the weight and similarly in case of natural siphon type we have the arrangement for weight that is when water falls because of the action of buoyancy this float rises up and when this float rises up we have a pen arm set here which scribbles against the graph paper and we know that this siphons would help us take care of any excess water uh, and it will take it out through the natural siphon effect because once this gauge gets full we would have this siphon action initiated resulting in drainage of the excess water the reason that it is called as a natural siphon type because we are not forcefully draining the water we are letting that siphon action to get triggered when there is enough water that is present in that particular gauge and it's a natural siphon action that helps us maintain this gauge this is the most commonly used and recommended gauge by indian standards and you can find its detail in is 5235 and again we will not worry about that what goes inside these codes but it is worth knowing that how these precipitation measurement is actually carried out in the field now as the technology is advancing you might have heard doppler effect and radar effects are being used to measure precipitation and the good thing about radar is that one radar is good enough to cover around 200 kilometers of line of sight or 10000 square kilometers of areas to measure precipitation effectively so how radars work we will look into their basic functionality so we send out a pulse of a given strength here and once this electromagnetic wave pulse is sent it will collide with the mass of water vapors or the mass of falling water that is present in given area and we will get an echo back 
we measure the strength of this echo we already know that what is the uh, outgoing radiation strength or p that we have uh, used to penetrate into these clouds or penetrate into the rainfall mass that is falling on the surface and it is calibrated against the amount of precipitation expressed in inches so typically we measure that what is the amount of z which in turn is function of how much echo we are going to receive and we can relate it to the rainfall using empirical relationships such as a inverse z raised to power 1 by b where a and b are the parameters that are pre known for a radar now but the here the most important thing is that uh, using the concepts that we have learned from electromagnetic radiations or propagation of waves in a media we can also effectively use it to measure precipitation now uh, uh, satellites are also being used to effectively measure how much precipitation a particular area has received and both active and passive remote sensing uh, techniques are widely used to measure how much precipitation has fallen onto a given area so this is sort of a high level introduction that what kind of techniques go inside measuring the precipitation and as an engineer depending upon the site requirement sometimes you have to also adapt to indigenous ways or uh, uh, out of the box ways to measure precipitation in absence of any of these standard measuring gauges but ultimately we are our objective is to express the depth of precipitation per meter square of area now an important question arises how many rain gauges we should have in a given area for example you are made in charge of a particular state that you have to put x number of rain gauges in that area what kind of factors you should look into and how you would decide depending upon the kind of terrain you have or the variability in precipitation you have so the two major factors that help us decide that how many rain gauges we should put is that how much variability we have in given area for example if you look at state of maharashtra during monsoons coast coastal areas specifically cities along west coast receive high amount of precipitation as compared to some inner regions on the other hand if you look into the thar desert area these areas receive scanty rainfall which is uniformly distributed and resulting in formation of a one of the uh, significant landmass represented as a desert in rajasthan so it is very clear that if the variability in precipitation is high we would need more number of rain gauges on the other hand if variability is less or terrain is hard uh, in in a sense that even if we put 100 gauges in 1 square kilometer and we know that this area is already going to receive scanty or minimal amount of rainfall that is wastage of investment so depending upon the rainfall characteristics rainfall type and variability we decide how many gauges we have to put second thing is we have to also look into the error tolerance for example if you are near an airport facility where you know that we cannot underestimate or overestimate amount of precipitation that we are going to receive in that area or estimate how it is going to impact the aerial operations or flight operations we care a lot about accuracy and to make sure that we are capturing even smaller of the variability in vicinity of that airport the number of gauges that we should put should be higher and finally we have to look into terrain we know that in hilly hill, hill areas or himalayan region the variability of precipitation is very high because of the terrain one side would be windward side another side would be leeward side and generally windward side receives more precipitation on an average as in comparison to the leeward side or descending side as a result of which the heterogeneity that we have because of terrain is high and hence terrain becomes an important factor to decide how many preci precipitation measuring gauges we should take place in a given area again there is an is code is 4987 that recommends how many gauges we should put and the recommendation is that in hilly areas we should go for around 100 to 50 to 250 km square of area should be covered by one gauge similarly in plain areas we can afford to put one gauge for 600 to 900 square kilometer of area 
whereas in deserts or in polar areas we can put less number of gauges and 1500 to 10000 square kilometer of area can be covered by one gauges and these are recommendations and depending upon the local context as well as feasibility to fit number of gauges in that terrain this number is adapted according to the local condition now this is the theoretical discussion that we have spun around that how many gauges we need but can we quantify whether the number of gauges that we have put is adequate or not so let us look into some of the quantification and uh, aspects of identifying whether we are uh, adequate in providing gauges or not so as we learned that higher is the variability we will say that this variability is measured by some factor called as cv the number of gauges should be high and we call this cv as coefficient of variation and it is often expressed in percentage this cv is mathematically defined as the ratio of standard deviation for the samples that we are observing divided by mean or represented by mu of the precipitation that we have observed at the gauges that are present in given area and to express it in percent we multiply it by 100 also we learned that if our error tolerance is less we should have large number of gauges ideally to have zero error we should have infinite number of gauges in a given area so we can say that our number of gauges are inversely proportional to epsilon where epsilon is our error tolerance again expressed in percentage that is we are fine with 10% error or we are fine with 20% error that's what this epsilon represent now when we put this together it has been observed that the number of gauges in fact is cv divided by epsilon raised to power b where beta of uh, b all often takes the value of 2 and we can measure cv mathematically as we mentioned ratio of standard deviation and mean we can uh, we can take the value of epsilon from the policy specification that what is our error tolerance and we can simply put these numbers now if you have forgotten the formula for standard deviation standard deviation is given by for samples if we have m samples denominator would be m minus 1 and summation i from 1 to m pi minus p bar square where p bar is also the average precipitation that a given area receives which is simply arithmetic mean of number of rain gauges that are placed in that area now to concretize this concept let us look into an example so this is an example that i have taken from our textbook it says that a catchment has six rain gauges in a year annual rainfall recorded by these gauges are 82.6 102.9 180.3 and so on the two questions that we have asked are determine the standard error in estimation of mean rainfall and second question is that let us say that we specify that what is our error tolerance how many optimal number of gauges would be needed to be installed in a catchment so here we already have data for m equal to 6 we can calculate the average precipitation as 82.6 plus 102.9 plus 180.3 all the way till 136.7 divided by 6 we can also measure standard deviation as mentioned i equal to 1 to 6 value of precipitation at each site minus p mean that we estimated in last step its square divided by 6 minus 1 which is 5 and its square root by putting the values here we would get a term like 82.6 and upon simplification this mean comes out to be 118.6 mm so 82.6 minus 118.6 its square plus 102.9 minus 118.6 square all the way till 136.7 minus 118.6 square divided by 
5 and its square root gives us the standard deviation for the samples that we have observed which in this case comes out to be 35.04 centimeter which implies the coefficient of variation in percentage as 100 into 35.04 divided by 118.60 which is 29.5 percent. Now we to calculate how many number of gauges we need we would simply do CV upon epsilon square. We already have installed 6 gauges here which implies we know n equal to 6 and we have to calculate what is the percentage error that would happen and upon simplifying this error comes out to be CV divided by under root n and this is approximately 12.6 percent. Now if you have to calculate that if we want to keep the error within bounds all you have to do is substitute epsilon as 5 CV would remain same that we calculated as 29.54 and when you solve this you can get the number of gauges as 8.73 and that is always rounded off to the next higher decimal. So even if you are getting the value of 8.2, 8.3, it's better to place 9 gauges because our maximum tolerance for error is 5%. And we have made the calculation based on that. So if we put number of gauges higher, only then we are going to be within the limit. So this is one simple example that we can uh, work out easily once we have data collected from various gauges. In next video, we will look into the aspects of data preparation. That is once this data is recorded over a period of time, how to check for quality, how to check for consistency, and if there are some problems in consistency, how to correct it. Thank you.